thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Oh, well, uh, the new normal need a good and stable internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Somebody because... wants to sponsor a tower in my house, that might help. <laughs> because otherwise, uh, I mean, you know, because the new normal, uh, you soon I, be done. Yeah, I really yeah. apologize for this technical difficulties. Yeah, but it's okay, it's okay. Uh, yeah, uh, well, you know, we, yes, we, we hope, I hope uh, we, uh, we already uh, listened and got the idea of, uh, what is Michelle was to, uh, try to present us. Uh, I mean, uh, for this first batch of uh, Q and A and discussion, I'd like to have uh, growers uh, to comment and uh, Bart uh, also uh, as a consultant, and of course uh, more about Pongo uh, Alliance uh, from John Payne. Uh, can you, gentlemen, uh, maybe? Is it Olivia or uh, Agus Purnomo that would like to, to share the experience? Or maybe, well, I'm Muslim, so I give uh, Olivia the, the mic. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Olivia. And then uh, I would like to, to hear from Bart and then uh, John. I was hoping you were going to give Agus, he's my senior on this. No? Right, well, uh, Michel, thanks for the effort. We are, are Musima, so we are first. That way to go. Um, how to... Michel, thanks for, for the effort. It's been, I'm sure it's been trying for you to, uh, to try to uh, explain your point uh, with a bad internet connection. We, we will sponsor a lot of things, but we cannot sponsor an internet connection in, uh, in the UK somewhere. Sorry about that. Uh, about, about what you said about uh, biodiversity, I think to me it's a, uh, so we, we always touch on the matter of, of landscapes and today we're we all talking about palm, but to me when we, we talk about landscapes, we have to remember that it's not only about palm and, and that's, what, that's what makes it a bit, uh, a bit complicated. I would, I would make two, two comments as a, as a producer, if I take the, the view of a producer. One is that, uh, and what worries me is that producers do not still today might not realize that they are in a landscape and they cannot just, uh, they cannot just claim uh, what happens in their plantations. There's a Bahasa expression which, which I used in the past, which is katak di bawah temporung. So people cannot, we should not only look at our immediate impact within our plantations. I think today we have to look as a planter, as a plantation company, we have to consider what is our place in the landscape? And we have to claim that place in the landscape. You have to be responsible for your impact. You also have to uh, get other players in the landscape to recognize your rights. And I think that's that kind of balanced relationship that will yield better results in terms of conservation. I think you mentioned very, very appropriately the, the issue of uh, connectivity. And that's our major, major challenge. You might have a very good plantation that will leave good connectivity within its plantation, connecting to a plantation that doesn't have the same kind of interest and where connectivity will be lost. So it's, it's all about everybody claiming the right place in the, in the landscape. And I'll go back to the, the first point, which is everybody's blaming palm. In certain landscapes, palm might be the dominant crop, but one, it might not all be plantation companies. You might have plantation smallholders and, and the likes. And in many landscapes, you will have multiple crops in the landscape. So that landscape approach cannot be based on only one commodity, it has to be based on the landscape and what, what are the, uh, the outcomes that you want to achieve. So I think that that's, that's the difficulty of, um, of how we can plan at a landscape level, how we can have better impact. The collaboration between the various actors, everybody recognizing, accepting their responsibilities, but also having others recognize their rights. And, and the fact that it's a multi-sector approach if you want to achieve a real good impact at a landscape level. That's how I would, uh, I would look at it. So I, I know you're more involved with the palm sector, but how, how do we then uh, 
manage the other sectors at, at the landscape level. I think there are a few good examples, but maybe not so many, and we still need to learn and work a bit on that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Olivia. Mark? Uh, thanks, Patauga. Uh, thanks, Michel, for a, for a good presentation. Um, just to add a few points to the discussion, is uh, I've been walking around in Indonesia for about 30 years. Uh, I've seen the plywood boom, I've seen the paper and pulp boom, I've seen the sawit boom. Um, it's so easy to start to, uh, to scapegoat, like Oliver said, uh, one crop, in particular at this moment, uh, the oil palm. But we really need to see it in a much, in a much more holistic uh, perspective and address that we also need to look at other crops and other commodities uh, that, that are influencing uh, deforestation. And in that way, I see with uh, activists quite, uh, let's call it a Christian approach. Uh, the sins of the father, you're still responsible for it. We'll never forgive you, you'll never be good enough. And that's becoming problematic. Um, especially with the RSPO, much more so the RSPO has managed to create synergy between public and private standards. And there, has, there have been measurable impacts of it. And I think it would be, be really useful if there was research that starts looking at that as well to counterbalance some of the claims being made. Um, that's basically what I wanted to add to it. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, John, maybe you can share more about uh, Pongo Alliance to us. I'm getting there. Yeah. Yes. And I okay. thought you should have face. Thanks, Toga. Yeah. So I'm going to be slightly ill-managed and, and read from a prepared text. And I, my excuse is I wanted to say quite a lot. And I, people who know me ha know me well, I have a habit of going on easily for half an hour nonstop. So I, I wanted to make some points, and I'm going to read it out. I'll try to make it sound natural. Actually, before that, I, I want to take this opportunity to give credit to Michel Desile, because Hongo Alliance, which I'll tell you a bit about, in a moment. Um, really, I, I, there have been many people involved over the years, but it was really Michel's uh, persistence, probably several years ago now, in 2015, 16, 17, at ad hoc meetings involving several growers, several NGOs, other people like myself and herself, of course. And in fact, the name Pongo Alliance, which stands for Palm Oil, P-O, Palm Oil NGO Alliance, and those who have a biology degree or similar will know that Pongo is the scientific name for orangutans. So that name, in fact, was created spontaneously at a very ad hoc meeting, which happened to be held in the Wilmar headquarters in Singapore in 2015. Anyway, I wanted, I wanted to say this concept, Pongo Alliance, is, it has many people in it now, but Michel was probably the, the, the founder, I'd say. Michelle, I want to see a little smile. You're looking very glum. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> so now I'm going to start reading. So, Pongo Lance is a partnership of visionary oil palm growers. I think that's fair to say. Traders and nature conservation practitioners, and and to give it a legal basis, um, which of course you know everything has to have that at some point, um, whether we like it or not, the partnership is established as a company in Malaysia. So although we have partners from Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, some from Europe as well, uh, there's a Malaysian base, but that's purely for practical reasons. So we have a bank account here. Uh, that, that's, that's the main thing. So as of, as of now, we have 15 partners. Um, I won't run through them all because it's quite a long list. If you look at our website, if you Google it, you can see pongoants.org and see them. Um, hopefully there'll be more, um, 15 as of now, sort of more or less even balance um, between growers, a few other miscellaneous and several NGOs. My own NGO, by the way, my origin is in an NGO in Malaysia, Borneo Rhino Alliance, which is concerned with rhinos. So just to recap, as, as Michel mentioned, the, the vision of Pongo Alliance is, is, a, is a very broad one. It's making resilient landscapes a and people a reality. Having said that, the origin of this alliance really was very much from different perspectives how to address this wretched orangutan oil palm versus orangutan scenario that Michel described earlier. 
and which we still have. We know, right? Every once or twice a year, there's some sort of flare up on social media or, or somewhere that or there's an article about how oil palm is destroying our orangutans. So I'm going to take this opportunity also, apart from highlighting Michelle's important role, because my background is, is NGO and as a wildlife biologist, I'm going to look at things from that, that angle. So I want to highlight that if you, if you think on a very big scale, um, and what I mean is thousands of years time scale, whole of Southeast Asia, even the whole of the world, both theoretical biologists and practical ones who've done research, in fact, literally over the last hundred years since the 1920s, what, what it turns out theoretically and empirically by looking at actual reality on the ground is if you have a unit of, of area, I mean, it could be, say, Southeast Asia, it could be Pular Kalimantan, it could be anything. But what happens if you lose 50%, 5-0, 50 50% of that natural vegetation, which as you'll realize the natural vegetation of Southeast Asia and say Kalimantan, Borneo, Sumatra, that was tropical rainforest a few hundred years ago. So if you remove 50% of that vegetation, eventually you'll lose about 10% of all species. And I really want to highlight that because <clears throat> it's fundamental. So you, you, in our sort of small capsule of time, you know, say the 1990s, 2000s, 220 now, we, we imagine what we've seen in our lifetime, the last 20, 30 or 40 years. But the reality is at least 10% of species are going to go extinct if you have only 50% of the forest left. And worse than that, if you lose 90% of the forest, so if you imagine again Southeast Asia, I think it's a fair approximation to say that over the last maybe 5,000 years, 90% of the forest is gone. You expect to lose 50% of the species. And that's why I mean, people say, why are there no tigers in Borneo or why there's no this or that? And it's it's part of a very long-term process, which biologists call extinction debt, D-E-B-T, where it takes centuries, but you know, if a species go extinct, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over 10 or hundreds of, of years. So what I'm getting to, and I hope that what you'll sort of understand is that whereas what we tend to call protected areas, whether that's Hutan Lindong, Taman Nacional, or whatever it is, those sort of areas are, are purely relative historically recent human governmental driven um, phenomenon. And, and if you look at the basic biology, it means those national parks protected areas in the long run are, are, going, are only going to sustain maybe 50% of all the species that were there in the past. And sadly, that's a reality that a lot of my friends all, also in this line somehow ignore, um, maybe because it's such a sort of horrifying thought. Because as you will see, the implication is humans then, either we could let those extinctions go ahead, possible. Uh, if one wants to pre prevent extinctions, going on about reducing poaching or reducing habitat loss in the big picture is, is, is just a drop in the ocean. Somehow humans need to intervene to save species that will be going extinct. The species that will go extinct, as you can imagine, there's all sorts, but they will tend to be large animals, you know, which live in relatively low numbers naturally, which range over very big areas. Those are the more sensitive ones, like orangutans, which I'm about to come on to. So I, in, in my work, in my NGO work, I'm, I, I try to delve into various ways of, in ways in which humans can intervene uh, to prevent extinctions as a sort of add-on to protected areas. So some of you might have, I mean, there's, a, there's this sort of um, in, interface sometimes between academia and the palm oil industry. It's sort of, it's a bit stronger now that nowadays than it was in the past maybe. But one of the, one of the slogans that the, uh, more, the academic conservation biologists have brought up in, in recent years is land sharing versus land sparing. And what they mean is should people like ourselves who are interested in nature conservation should we aim to have more protected areas or should we share the land? In other words, allow nature conservation, conservation of biodiversity on privately owned or privately managed land. And of course, you'll see where I'm heading because in this case, our interest is oil palm and that, have, that covers a big land area. I don't know about you lot, but say in summer, where I've lived for more than, summer is in Malaysia, I've lived for more than 40 years. Um, I guess 40 years ago, zero point, 
0.01% of the land was oil palm, now it's 22%. So it's an enormous land area and it cannot, oil palm cannot be ignored in our, uh, most of us I see here are sort of Indonesia or Malaysia sort of biased. We, we cannot ignore the fact that oil palm plantations, if we want to share land with conserving nature, oil palm plantations are a very major thing we have to think of. So to so sort of close this, um, so I don't go on too much, I'm gonna close with, with our observations in Sabah, um, and which in, in many ways is the heart of what Pongo Alliance does now. So over the last, I think it's about 10 years, I'd say in Sabah, north part of Kalimantan, there's a population of very roughly 800 orangutans in one particular area. The area is called Kinabatangan, that's the name of the river there. So it turns out, as of the last few years, about 90% of that region, 90% of half a million hectares, 500,000 hectares, big area, is oil palm. Most, some smallholders, of course, but mostly big landowners. 1% um, only is maybe the community where people live, and the other 9% is forest. So if you can imagine that big chunk of land, half a million hectares, 10% forest, 1% people, 90% oil palm. But the thing is this that I want to focus on now is that, that those forests are scattered in very roughly 60, 60 blocks. They're not all in one big block. Um, I think the biggest block in one place is maybe sort of 5,000, 6,000 hectares, that, that sort of size. The smallest areas are less than a hectare. So going back to what I said earlier, so in that, in that landscape, there's about 800 orangutans. And um, what, what has happened, you know, hu humans, well, I won't go into the meaning of shifting baseline syndrome, but humans, again, think of what they've seen the last 40 years. And the approach to orangutan conservation over the last 40 years, which in many ways started in Sabah, there's a famous orangutan rehabilitation center that started in 1964. So what's been going on for now 60 years is, if you see an orangutan in an oil palm landscape, Someone goes in, either government or an NGO, takes the orangutan, rescues it, in inverted commas, and moves the orangutan somewhere else. What we've seen in this landscape with actual evidence now, um, largely by another NGO, Bhutan, that's been operating in this landscape for 20 years or so, Dr. Felicity Oran, who's a British lady who's done research there in the last five years. What we see is a very clear, I mean, provable pattern now. So, Female orangutans live in small forest patches. They stay there, even in quite small patches. Males move through the oil palm landscape, many, many kilometers through the oil palm. And of course, what they do is they look for females and they know where they are. They know them and they go and mate with them and they're moving around the landscape. So what, if you look as a biologist, what you have is a very scattered, low population density population of about 800 orangutans in lots of small forest patches, not one big one. But this, this historical background is continuing. In other words, the idea, you see an orangutan, you call the authorities an NGO, the NGO moves the orangutans out. And if you think a little bit, what you'll realize is that biologically, that removal of orangutan, orangutans is really no different from poaching them or, or hunting them, right? Because you're, you're moving animals out of where they've lived for the last 30 or 40 years to somewhere else. I just want to mention, by the way, that this landscape, of course, like any landscape, it, it didn't suddenly change overnight. Um, but what I can say of that half million hectares, 90% oil palm, roughly half is second planting now. So the bulk of that oil palm was planted in the 1980s, 1990s. So any orangutans that you see there have been there for 30 or 40 years, and individually they've adapted. Like whoever they are, wherever they are, they've adapted to live in the particular place that they live. So frankly, they don't need to be rescued. So I think I'll just round down what I'm saying now. I hope you get the bigger picture. So in fact, the origin of Pongo Alliance, and in my, in my view, the, almost the heart of Pongo Alliance now and, and for the foreseeable future, will be to try and look at afresh how to conserve orangutans in a predominantly oil palm landscape where there's some forest. And essentially, the basic thing is to leave them where they are. Sounds very simple, sounds very simple, but it's not, as, as all things in life, it's not quite that simple. And I th think it's fair to say there's two, many challenges, two major ones. The first one is acceptance. I mean, it seems great, but 
you know, academics in Europe, um, classical NGOs, even, and I have to say in, in this open venue, the government still has this view, orangutans cannot survive with this oil pump, take them out and move them somewhere else. So it's changing mindset. And frankly, that needs to start on the ground. You know, we, we, we can make give webinars like today, but if the individual concession, or as we call them in some way, state managers aren't on board, then nothing's really going to move. So I'd summarize by saying over the last one and a half to two years, one of the big focuses of Congo Alliance on the ground in Sabah, Malaysia, is to start changing these mindsets to a large extent bottom up rather than top down. And the other, finally, and the other big challenge to what I'm just telling you is that if you can sort of picture this landscape, and I, I hope you can, lots of oil palm quite well established, second cycle, lots of patches of forest, small to medium size, orangutans sort of scattered throughout. The, 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 if you want to stabilize that population of orangutans, if you want to keep them there and boost the numbers a bit, sorry, a slight aside, um, plantation managers are really worried. One of their many worries is, well, what happens if we, we, I mean, we come back 30 years from now, next cycle, and we got orangutans everywhere, and that, that will actually not happen because the natural carrying capacity of the environment for orangutans is very low. The numbers will never build up. But if you want to sustain that population, particularly if you remember those males that move through the landscape between one forest patch to the other, particularly for them, but not only, their limiting factor then is food. And orangutan food plants actually are quite well known. Many people have studied orangutans. So for example, the, the, the most important significant food plant for orangutans, wherever it is, whether it's Borneo, Sumatra, uh, are, are members of the genus Ficus, Ficus, F-I-C-U-S, bring in Ara, um, all those sort of names of which there's many species, and there's not only one species, there's about 150 species in the wild in Borneo. So what, what the other part of this story that Pongo Alliance is starting in, in the last two years, I'd say, is enriching the landscape with orangutan food plants. So it's not diptrocarps, it's not acacias, it's not all this sort of standard restoration plants, it's orangutan food plants. And we're fortunate, I think, or I feel fortunate in the sense that we do have RSPO, in our case, MSPO, ISPO. We have sort of general guidelines. And I think it's fair to say in most places, the riparian, the riverside zone and steep slopes are considered low productivity areas for oil palm. So those are the sort of places in Pongo Lines where we're doing that restoration, steep slopes, swamps and riversides. That's where we're putting those orangutan, orangutan food plants. I see slight signs of restlessness. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for your patience, Toga, and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, before for the, the second batch, uh, something that uh, about orangutan has been uh, lingering in my mind. I want to share you, you guys a screen. Uh, okay. Uh, Everybody can see, All right? This one is, uh, as you see, is uh, I got a screen uh, uh, screenshot from a Greenpeace map, and if you see here, this is his orangutan habitat, which is the one that yellows here, right? Okay. Now, uh, and this one is palm oil concession in Kalimantan, right? So where, wherever it was a white one, uh, white here is now palm oil, okay? And then have another one, a selective logging concession, happy half, right? Right in the middle. The one that was not palm oil was logging concession, right? Okay. And then, uh, if you put that all together, palm oil concession, logging concession, and orangutan habitat, the one that is already, is, it, it's, it, it's still a forest, 
that still has trees for orang otan's uh, habitat, their houses, where is it actually? Here, right in the middle. Right? But what is happening there? In this middle part? There are chains over there. People cutting trees. Because this is a selective logging concession there. Right? So what happened? The orangutan will run away from their house because their house is being destroyed. This is my personal view. Right? And wh where they are going? They are going north, they are going east, they are going south, they are going west. And what kind of things that they will meet there? It's all palm plantation. And that's where they are being caught, in that all palm plantation. And everybody will say that oil palm destroy orangutan habitat but in fact there are still pristine jungle here right in the middle of kalimantan but those jungles those forests is actually is being licensed to to cut so my point is yes I mean, John was saying about, you know, some, uh, whatever years ago, it was all the numbers. Yeah. But orangutan orang now, their habitat is not, is not being destroyed by, I mean, they, the habitat was destroyed by oil palm. But their habitat now, now, is being destroyed by Logging concession. So, if we want to 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 to, to have this uh, orangutan habitat uh, exist, what 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 we should do? Stop the concession of logging. So they would have their so the orangutan would have their own house. It's not being destroyed. If 10 years, 20 years from now, this middle part completely gone by the logging concession, this is where, this is the time that I would say orangutan would go extinct. And the map came from our friend in Greenpeace. And this map does not exist anymore. <laughs> They've taken it out. Yeah. I don't know if I could find the same map again like this. I haven't explored the Global Forest Watch map, you know, if you want to try to put like this. But this one, the Greenpeace map, was not, somehow was not, you, you cannot really find it on their link, but it was there. But now, if you if you type in all this uh, the address above you can find it you take it out so there's also additional uh, i mean for for you michelle john and bart uh, this this already in on on my thought for some years right what is the problem with uh, what is not a problem how how are we going to see these orangutan things uh, in terms of uh, their habitat and in terms of conservation, uh, who to conserve actually? Is it palm oil? Do I hear? Or is it the logging that we need to focus on? Discussion open. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to comment? Or? Buddy, please. Yeah. Yes, Buddy. Buddy. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pak Togar, for providing me time to speak. Yeah. First of all, I want to, to highlight about deforestation. Uh, we, we have to know that 
deforestation start, it is start since in the beginning of civilization. We have to know that deforestation has occurred in all over the world. I think we have to study history, either in Europe, America, or uh, everywhere. We have deforestation. It is the first. Therefore, speaking about deforestation, we have to be wise uh, because uh, especially, especially deforestation in our country, as Pak Dugar highlight, is not, is not only, is not starting, is not starting since plantation, oil palm plantation uh, built up. We have history like also in, in uh, history in everywhere that uh, deforestation is start, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Ma. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Uh, deforestation start since civilization. Therefore, linking deforestation with oil palm must to be wise. Should be wise. S -s 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah. Should be wise. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, my point is, uh, let's be about detail if you want to link deforestation with oil palm plantation. Because uh, in our history, in our history, since civilization of uh, like uh, kingdom built up, it is deforestation start. And also, uh, well, I have to move. Yeah. And also uh, about, for, for example, uh, in, in the beginning of about 70, because of starting what we call bangunan or development of country. And at that time, Pak Budi, Pak Budi, you need to stay because uh, GSM, geser sikit mati. Yes. Oh, so, 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 yeah. Uh, well, uh, Linking deforestation with uh, plantation must be wise. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, and secondly, I think we have to 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 know that uh, relating to our our living, uh, we have to to be in in harmony with animal and then with plantation and also with human itself. We have to share space. We have to share space because we need each other. We need, plant, we need uh, animal, we need plant, we need each other. Therefore, we have to share space. To do so, we have to make a, what we call it planning. In our country, there is what we call it rencana tata ruang wilayah, spatial planning. And we can, we can do planning, uh, space for, space for, animal, space for uh, plantation, and so on. And we speak not only, not only for orangutan, but also for other wild animal. I think uh, making planning for living harmony in our planet is quite important. That's my point. Thank you very much. <laughs>